and go. Um, oh, okay. I guess perhaps maybe we're supposed to start. Um, okay. uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Thank you for joining us tonight to uh, talk about Kim Todd's fabulous new book, Sensational. Um, we're happy to have you with us. My name is William Souter, and I'm joining Kim tonight um, to talk about her book. But before we do that, I first have to uh, say happy birthday, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> you're, welcome, you're welcome. I should explain to uh, our audience, I suppose, that Kim and I know each other. Uh, we belong to uh, a writing group in Minneapolis that for a number of years has met uh, every couple of weeks. Uh, at least we did until the pandemic came and, and that's um, uh, reduced our opportunities to get together. But uh, over the course of uh, quite a few months, we had a chance to see parts of Kim's book in progress. And so it's a, it's a special um, thrill for me to kind of see the finished book now uh, after we had a chance to uh, look at it in its infancy a while back. So um, uh, we'll get started here. I, basically, um, it's a very straightforward uh, deal tonight. Kim is going to read a little bit and then we're going to talk some and then we're going to invite all of you to, uh, to talk. If you look down in the uh, right hand corner of your screen you'll see a, a box with the ask a question next to it you can type in a question there and when we get to the uh, second part of things we will try to uh, uh, address as many of them as we can so uh, i think let's get started and kim if you want to read an excerpt from the book maybe you should explain a little bit about the context but let's uh, dive in yeah great um thank you bill and for those of you who don't know um William Souter is a noted biographer, in addition to being a member of my writing group. And he's written biographies of Audubon and Rachel Carson, and most recently, a wonderful biography of John Steinbeck called Mad at the World. So we had lots of good discussions about writing about people. So the section that I'm going to read today, um, Sensational talks about this decade of opportunity for women doing undercover reporting, exposing societal ills of the Gilded Age. But it all got started because of the overwhelming success of this one um, reporting job done by a reporter who some of you may have heard of called Nellie Bly. And Nellie Bly went undercover for Joseph Pulitzer's The World newspaper, which was one of the most famous newspapers of the day. And in 1887, she pretended to be insane and got herself committed to Blackwood's Asylum for Women. Um, and when she came out, um, she, she spent 10 days there. And when she came out, she wrote this expose of how the terrible food and the freezing cold living conditions and the fact that most of the women didn't even seem to her to be insane. They were um, poor, maybe they were immigrants who didn't speak good English, maybe they were women whose families wanted to get rid of them. Um, and it was a very explosive revelation that appeared in her work. So I just, the section that I wanted to read um, is right, talks about the effect of this reporting that she did for the world. At the time of Bly's stunt, women who made the news were generally murdered, murderers, or fallen from virtue. Front page stories from weeks just before and after Bly's asylum articles included, he dug her grave, shooting, stabbing, and burying an old woman. Mrs. Robinson's fatal leap, a Louisville woman suicide. She ran away from home, story of Niagara girl found wandering in Boston streets and a bride choked with gas. And the reporters who wrote about the enigmatic waif in the courtroom, that was um, other papers were reporting on Bly when she was being committed, not knowing who she was, that she was a reporter, tried to fit her in one of those boxes. Was she a pathetic innocent or had she been seduced and abandoned? If Bly's entry into journalism showed anything, it was that representation of women in newspapers altered women's lives. She got her start protesting a columnist's thoughts about her sex's natural abilities. Two years later, Bly wrote a new kind of woman, one who 
took action, did good, was brave. And this heroine was battling institutions. Judges, police officers, medical experts, all had been wrong. The Bellevue doctors were convinced that Bly was hysterical, but her whole experience undermined their authority to make this diagnosis. After she passed a second round of tests, she wrote, I began to have a smaller regard for the ability of doctors than I ever had before and a greater one than myself, for myself. I felt sure now that no doctor could tell whether people were insane or not, so long as the case was not violent. Part of the asylum story's appeal was this kind of audacity, but another lure was its style. For comparison, here's W.T. Stead, a reporter who went undercover for the Pall Mall Gazette in England. He embellished his sentences with ornate clauses and classical references at the start of the maiden tribute of modern Babylon, which is the famous um, series that he wrote. In ancient times, if we may believe the myths of Hellas, Athens, after a disastrous campaign, was compelled by her conqueror to send once every nine years a tribute to Crete of seven youths and seven maidens, the doomed 14 who were selected by lot amid the lamentations of the citizens returned no more. And then he quoted Ovid in Latin. Here's Bly in the first paragraph of her Blackwell's expose. Could I pass a week in the insane asylum at Blackwell's Island? I said I could, and I would, and I did. Bly shook three of, free of the ruffles and hoop skirts of Victorian prose and made her sentences accessible to the less educated and recent immigrants who might struggle with English, the specific readers Pulitzer coveted. While advocating for serious reform, her writing was always a pleasure to read. She was funny, up all night at the temporary home for women, she spent hours watching the mice that landed on her quilt and crawled over her pillow and the cockroaches that struck her as unusually large and fast. I believe I made some valuable studies in natural history, she wrote. Bly included ample dialogue. She was also unabashedly vain and the humor is partially at her own expense. After her hair dried in knots following an asylum bath, a nurse combed it out, braided it and tied it with a red rag. My curly bangs refused to stay back, Bly wrote, so that at least was left of my former glory. Though Bly's prose had its flaws, something in it invited the reader into the seat next to her to come along for the ride. For Bly, the stunt, stunt drove the story, the delight in fooling the powerful, the slipping disguise, the fact of her being a rather poor actress, it all added to the drama. In fact, it was most of the drama as she often breezed by genuine hazards. When she was at Bellevue, a doctor came into her room as she got ready to sleep. He sat on the edge of the bed and put his arm around her, asked about Cuba and said, don't you remember me? I remember you. In the article in the world, Bly mentioned that this doctor was particularly handsome and commented, it was a terrible thing to play insane before this young man and only a girl can sympathize with me in my position. But in the version she published in, as a book a few months later, she acknowledged that his caress could be read the wrong way. Some people have since censured this action, she wrote, but I feel sure, even if it was a little indiscreet, that the young doctor only meant kindness to me. A sexual encounter, even against her will, would have bumped her out of the good woman class. Chastity meant credibility. Throughout her story, Bly downplayed real risks, disease, assault, drugging, and highlighted less significant ones, that her hair was a mess, that she might burst out laughing and blow her cover. This strong first-person point of view immersed readers in the narrator's experience. Bly's tone was confiding, a whisper to a trusted friend, rather than the assertions of a disembodied observer, and the body she inhabited was specifically young and female. The reader was right next to her, shivering, thrown into the icy bath, smelling spoiled meat, responding to a handsome doctor, hiding behind a veil. This vivid narrator, full of life, moral but not preachy, was clearly enjoying herself. And if this little scrap of a person, this mere girl, as the Hazel Green Herald put it, could take on the whole system of institutions with wit and compassion and negligible acting ability, what couldn't be done? A stunt reporter had real power. Suddenly, everybody wanted to hire one or be one. And that kind of launches us into this decade of women yeah. clamoring for these jobs and editors being very eager to hire them. So Kim, is it fair to say that Nellie Bly is the original, the, the sort of prototype for this group of, of, uh, of American-based um, uh, girl reporters, stunt reporters? 
Yeah, she she really was. And you know, it was it was not that people hadn't gone undercover before right. um, or done this sort of like first person narration of being in disguise and going to an otherwise inaccessible place. Um, but it was a combination of all of those things. It was that she was female going into a female dominated space um, mm -hmm. and that she was in disguise and that you know her work resulted in real change. She got a lot more money um, earmarked right. for the asylum and got some female doctors hired there. Um, and again, like then just like the voice and the tone and this sort of very like accessible, lively storytelling, which made um, meant that her work sold a lot of papers and that was mainly what Pulitzer sure. and then Hearst, his main rival really cared about. So they're like, well, if it works, let's do it. It must have been the case also that there were many other young, ambitious women out there that saw Nellie Bly's work and thought, wow, that I could do that. That's that's a that's a that's a thing. And um, yeah. I think that probably spawned. Uh, it seems like that spawned uh, this kind of almost movement that you document so well in the book. I love that passage that you read. Um, one of the things it shows that I think readers are going to love about this book is that um, it, it there's this sort of dual track in which you are telling the story of the women, but you're also re reporting the stories that they told. And uh, and both of those things are really, really compelling and really, um, uh, it, it's just really wonderful, wonderful material. So um, one of the questions that I uh, want to add, this always comes up, it always gets asked, so let's, uh, let's, let's do it right now. Um, People always want to know how you came to write this book, and it sounds like a um, it sounds like a throwaway question, but it's really not. If you think about what we do, Kim, deciding what to write about, coming up with what to write about, getting inspired by something, whether it's by accident, whether it's by dint of hard work, and just kind of knowing that a certain thing was out there, it's it's such an important part of the process. You you are going to marry yourself to this project for years. And yeah. uh, you want to you want to choose carefully. So uh, tell us how this book came about, how you got into it, and if you can include a little bit about uh, researching the book because uh, this is an impeccably and ambitiously researched book. Uh, you you clearly spent a lot of time pouring over old newspapers and archival records and and um, uh, city directories. So tell us <laughs> tell us about the book and how it came to be. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's that's really, I mean, you're right, it's an often asked question, but it's also a really great question. And I like your point about, you know, it's such a commitment to get obsessed by something, right? It's like yeah, three yeah. years, it's four years, uh, and you don't want to be like going down a rabbit hole that doesn't go anywhere. And someone asked me recently, like, if all my ideas became booked, and I was like, oh no, like, there's the file cabinet by my desk, and there's the file cabinet in the garage, which I'm is like right the grave there. of dead books. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, so this one came about, it was a little bit like two pronged. Like, one was I did, was just reading 10 Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly and was just so struck by how many of the things that she were, was doing was really all of the traits that we think of as belonging to creative nonfiction these days or even uh, new journalism as Tom Wolfe was talking about it. You know, and then she's doing it almost a century earlier. Um, so I was really taken by that and it became clear that, you know, that she wasn't a standalone figure as she's often presented, that all of these women like had really been inspired by her. And that was part of like, um, I don't know, the stages down the rabbit hole was sort of saying like, oh, not just this one, but also this one and also this right, one. Right. And then a long time ago, I had read a book um, by Leslie Reagan um, called When Abortion Was a Crime. And in that she references this undercover reporting by this reporter for the Chicago Times in 1888, which is just a little a little more than a year after Bly goes undercover. So this reporter is very much part of this wave. Um, and she goes undercover for the Chicago Time and asks hundreds of doctors in Chicago for an abortion, which is illegal at the time. Um, and then reports for the Chicago Times, you know, what they said to her. It's all scene based. So she, you know, shows scenes of them mm -hmm. in their offices and how they respond to her question. Um, and I got very interested as I was thinking about this wave of stunt reporters um, 
and who she was and who she might have been. And so one of the projects of the book was to see, you know, if I could, if there was some way to figure that out. And so I spent a lot of time at the um, Harold Washington Library in Chicago. Many of these newspapers are digitized, but the Chicago Times, alas, is not. Um, so, you know, going through microfilm after microfilm of these old papers, um, trying to trace her back. So the research, as you pointed out, was was all encompassing, but it was really a lot of fun. I mean, the writers were themselves were very prolific. So there was a ton of material to work with in terms of, you know, their output, their adventures, um, you know, di different things that they'd reported on. And then for some, like this girl reporter of the Chicago Times, there was no other piece of it. There was no way to, um, you know, figure out what was going on in their life outside the words that they were committing and printing to the newsprint. Um, but for some, there was a lot of information. So um, Bly has some like wonderful letters, you know, particularly to her mother or to this editor who became a good friend, Arthur Brisbane. Um, mm -hmm. One of the writers that I read, Eva McDonald, also has like really engaging letters and did like an oral history of her life. Another one, Elizabeth Jordan wrote a memoir. Um, another one, Elizabeth Banks wrote three memoirs. And in each one, she says, well, I didn't really tell the truth in the last memoir, but this is the real, <laughs> this is really what happened. Yeah. Um, so it's fun to like, yeah. you know, untangle all that and then kind of see, yeah, like the different personas that they're adopting in their newspaper writing, in their memoir writing, in their letters given to different people. Um, it was interesting because Elizabeth Jordan, who is a, a reporter and then an editor for um, Pulitzer's World and who hired a lot of these stunt reporters herself, um, she wrote a memoir and has kind of one account of her experiences at the world, but then, um, I found at Syracuse University had like documentation of um, interviews that other people had done with her later that weren't eventually published. And she's much more frank. Like she tells like <laughs> who was having affairs with whom and that yeah, so and yeah. so is really a jerk. And um, yeah, so layers upon layers, which was fun to delve into. So at some point you took these, uh, these great stories and um, and devised a, a theory of the book. You know, when you, you have to write a proposal and take it to your editor and editors are born skeptics. And so you must have been asked, you know, yeah, but what's the book about? Or what's the through line? That's a favorite, uh, that's a favorite phrase that you get. But in terms of, think, of the book writ large, what, you know, yeah. just briefly, sort of what's your theory of the book or what's the point of the book or what's the takeaway from the book? Yeah, well, I remember that I brought the proposal to writing group, Bill, and yeah. you're, everyone was like, oh, this is great. Just send it as it is. And you were like, this is a lot of characters. <laughs> you're going to have to explain <laughs> how you're going to deal with all these characters. So, I mean, the way that I thought of it was like not a biography of a specific person, but really the biography of this genre. You know, so how did it get its start? what kind of different things fed it. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, it has this rise where in 1896, you know, you open the Sunday World or um, William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal. And there's yeah. just like so many stunt reporters. Right. Like, I don't know if people use the phrase like jumped the shark anymore, but like it had kind of jumped the shark. Like there was yeah. so many women doing this sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, it talks about the the end of the genre, which ended pretty definitively um, at and after the Spanish-American War, right. where the women had had opportunity to do all these things and go all these places, but um, war reporting was like a step too far for these New York editors who did not assign any women to go do it. And then after the um, Spanish-American War, there was a lot of discomfort in the field of journalism about what was perceived as like yellow journalism and um, you know some flat out falsehoods which had been promoted by the two papers, particularly right. the world and the journal. Um, and whenever when people decided like let's throw like yellow journalism in the trash, like this stunt reporting was very much something which which reporting right after that would define itself against and was considered kind of part of that 
thing which people wanted to get rid of. You know, I remember uh, going to writing group and 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 talking to you about the difficulty of having a huge ensemble. I've had to deal with that before. It's very, very challenging. And uh, for the people listening in tonight, Kim's done an amazing job of kind of solving that problem. Uh, partly by using, there is a natural chronology to a lot of this. There are, uh, there is sort of an order in which some of these women appear. There's a lot of overlap, but but the book moves forward, you know, in time in a very cohesive way. And then the great thing is that towards the end, all of these separate threads, you know, this woman, that woman here, over here, they all begin to kind of entwine. They kind of come together. And as Kim just said, uh, at the end of the 19th century and on the eve of the uh, Spanish-American War, um, it's reached a kind of crescendo. And uh, so I, you did a great job, I think, of managing um, this very unruly um, uh, group of, of women. I, th I thought we might take just a couple of minutes, and you can answer very briefly, but I thought we should just run through a handful of the names. And you can maybe just tell us Sure. briefly who they were and what they did. And um, I think that'll give people a flavor of what we're what we're talking about. One of the things that struck me, and you may see it differently, Kim, I don't know, but um, was there was a great deal of commonality between these women. They were very, very much alike for the most part. They had, a, I thought they had sort of similar backstories, similar ambitions, and, and in many cases, similar approaches to to what they did. And I, I thought that was interesting, but I, I'd like to hear what you think about that. But anyway, uh, let's just run through a few. I'll, I'll give you a name and you sure. can, you can, yeah. uh, let's start Sounds with, um, we've already talked about Nellie Bly. Let's talk about Eva McDonald. Yeah. Um, well, Bill and I are both in Minnesota and Eva McDonald was from, she was from St. Paul and she got hired by the St. Paul Globe to I think in a jab at the sister city write about factory conditions in Minneapolis. And so she um, kind of just snuck into various factories and reported on um, the poor conditions there, but also just like miserable, miserable pay. And the pay had recently been cut. So the women were like even more upset. Um, and they weren't just upset about um, the pay cut though, they were really upset about um, the foreman in this one particular factory who was just like very cruel and very dismissive of the women and did what today would be considered to be sexual harassment. And within a few weeks of, you know, um, McDonald's reporting, the women went on strike at that particular factory. And that dovetailed with her life very closely in that she got her start in journalism and reported on a number of different of um, factories, but then she really found her heart as like a labor activist, right, and right. she apparently gave amazing speeches and um, traveled all over giving speeches. Was hired by different labor organizations to give speeches. She returned to journalism at one point, um, but I think her her real heart was in labor activism. And she said a number of times she was one that had an oral history, um, that she sort of wished that she could have gone to law school, um, but she really did everything but. Um, so so yeah, she, it was interesting to me in the book, if I, read, if I read it right, it sounds like she simply walked in or got into these factories and then sort of talked to people discreetly. I, I don't know why she didn't get thrown out or why nobody said, who is that woman or, or why people talked to her, but it strikes me as a, as a, um, uh, would have taken considerable courage to do that. And uh, and uh, that is another common theme with all these women, I think, which is that they uh, were unafraid to uh, put themselves into um, risky situations. And um, so that's interesting. Uh, let's let's keep going. I wanted to ask about Nell Nelson. Yeah, so, I mean, again, it's just interesting how quickly all of this happens after Bly's stunt. So her Bly, her Bly's stunt is published in 1887. So in March of 1888, you have right. Eva McDonald going into factories. That summer, you have Nell Nelson, whose real name was Helen Cusack, um, going into factories on behalf of the Chicago Times. And she did similar work um, that Eva McDonald did, um, but her series had a much larger reach 
because, um, you know, you don't want to judge people against each other, but she's a much better writer. You know, right. McDonald's was sort of like prosaic, um, straightforward writing and Nelson really like put you in the scene and created interesting characters um, and wrote in a way that was like very filled with outrage about the situation, but at the same time, um, not in a way that came across as ranty, but that really like engaged people with the issues going on in, in their lives. And she um, <clears throat> did the series for the Chicago Times and then got hired by the New York world who kind of had like censors out all over the country for anyone who was doing good mm -hmm. and interesting writing. Um, and so then she stayed at the world and um, did a similar series there, advocated for female factory inspectors there and worked there for a number of years. Um, was she was she there at the same time that Nellie Bly was? Because I think Nellie Bly also ended up at the world. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. You talked about like the problem of having all of these separate characters and how do you make their story come together? Um, and I there's like a number of places where the stories come together. One is the world in the early 1890s, just again because it's the place that everyone wants to work. Right. So Nellie Bly is there and Nell Nelson's there and Elizabeth Jordan, who I mentioned as being like going on to having a career as an editor there. Um, you know, it's like this magnet drawing people from all over yeah. the country. So they're all there at the same time. Then there's another big news event, which is um, the Lizzie Borden mur murders and a number of reporters that I was talking about went to cover the Lizzie Borden murder. So Elizabeth Jordan goes right. and there's this um, woman who knew Borden as a child named Kate Swan McGurk and she well, goes. Let's, let's talk about Kate Swan McGurk. Oh, I, yeah, I, was just gonna, I was just going to ask about her. <laughs> I mean, that's um, it's a very arresting segment of the book. And um, I'm going to confess, and I, I suspect there are many people out there that I really didn't know how the Lizzie Borden story ended. I thought I did, but I was totally wrong. And um, and so she is this historical figure in my mind that um, uh, it didn't turn out the way I thought it would. But talk to us about uh, Kate Swan McGurk. Yeah, so Kate Swan McGurk has a really interesting career trajectory, um, particularly related to some of the arguments in this book. I mean, she started out as like the most straight-laced respectable reporter. I mean, I think she was a very good reporter. She started working, she was the editor of her high school newspaper. She, you know, started working very young, um, got married, but quickly left her husband behind and moved to Washington DC to do like political reporting. Um, so she was doing that for a while, you know, and, and was very well respected. Um, and then she, has this reportorial coup, which is that she has the only interview with Lizzie Borden um, that a reporter was able to achieve. Um, because this is, in, this is in prison, right? Or in jail while she's away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes to visit yeah. her in jail. And Borden just hates reporters because they're so terrible to her. You know, they just right. say, like, oh, she's so ugly. She's so monstrous. She has arms like a man. Like, clearly, she's a murderer. Like, they, they just, or she doesn't cry enough. They were all like, they were very <laughs> obsessed with her, her not crying enough about the death of her father. Um, but, but McGurk, who was a childhood friend, kind of, or childhood acquaintance, like gets this interview with her. And then she, McGurk sort of, I'm calling her McGurk, her married name was McGurk, so Kate Swan McGurk. And then she kind of disappears for this, from the scene. And the next time that she really comes to prominence, I mentioned that there was this sort of stunt reporter craze in 1896 yeah. when Pulitzer yeah. and Hearst are really going head to head. And she is just all over the world Sunday papers. Like almost every Sunday paper that you open has like not just a story by her, but like a huge illustration of her like climbing a rope up a bridge or um, <laughs> one like testing out the electric chair, you know? So it's just like page after page of, of Kate Swan McGurk. And, um, and so, and, she does these sort of more stunts under the name Kate Swan, but right. also sometimes on the same page are much more straight laced articles like political interviews by Mrs. McGurk, um, who's like just another persona. 
that she puts sure. forward. Yeah. And um, I mean, her trajectory is, is interesting to me because she did basically use her real name and a lot of these other women didn't. And when this yellow journalism stunt reporting fell into disrepute, like she just couldn't recover from it. Um, she actually left journalism and um, got her bachelor's of science and went around the country demonstrating the use of gas stoves. Right, right. So, Did you figure out why why the use of, uh, of um, uh, pen names or, you know, alternate uh, identities was so prevalent? Obviously, some of the reporting, I guess, was... Um, uh, would have put the report, maybe cast the report in a bad light. Maybe they were worried about the reputation or, uh, or, or um, some sort of retaliation from uh, things they'd report. But why, why, the, why the secrecy about, um, about their identities? I mean, I think it was a protective measure and some, for some part, so you didn't end up like, you know, Kate Swan McGurk. Um, it was just sort of a convention of the time as well. I, you know, as it as it developed later, like Nellie Bly and Nell Nelson were able to um, kind of use their pseudonym as their brand and their name appeared right. in their headlines and they really built careers off that name even though it was a pseudonym. Um, and I think people knew who the person underneath the pseudonym was. It became, more risky of a strategy for them, again, sort of in 1896, um, when the publishers really, and editors really started to control the names. So you had like characters like Meg Merrilies or the journal woman, and a number of different reporters would write underneath that umbrella. So the actual reporters didn't really have a way to build a career or you know, establish their unique voice it was much more something under control of the editors. And that was where, you know, it became a liability for them not right. to be writing under their right, real name. Right, right, right. Um, let me ask about just uh, one more and so we can move on a little bit, but uh, we've entered our second half hour. So I wanna encourage uh, anyone out there listening who has a question by all means, um, uh, and there's a question now. So let, let's, since since we are past the half hour point, let's uh, let's in, let's intersperse some questions from uh, people who are participating tonight. Um, oh, who who? Uh, this question is from uh, Erica, who wants to know who were the newspaper readers at the time? Were the newspaper editors trying to get more women readers? Yeah. Great question. Um, yes. Thanks, Erica. Um, so yes, they were really trying to broaden readership in whatever way possible. So one of um, Pulitzer's visions for his paper was that he wanted to attract um, the less educated audience who might not have, you know, be able to understand the Ovid in Latin. And, you know, there was a huge wave of immigration, particularly into New York at the time, and he wanted to attract all of those readers. Um, and also, Yes, like like women readers were very specifically an audience, and you know the papers had kind of been catering to them for a while with the women's pages, um, which were pretty boring. And boy, did female journalists hate to write for them. <laughs> like as I was paging through letters, it was just like complaint after complaint of these female reporters, like please give me something more interesting to do. So it was. So not only was this kind of expansion of coverage um, of benefit to the reporters who got to do more interesting, meaningful work, but I think it was of great advantage to the uh, female readers who also got to, you know, read about factory conditions as opposed right, to, you right. know, the bustle pro and con. So, so I it's, it does seem to me that the appearance of these girl stunt reporters in the late 1800s is really not accidental. This is, a, this is an important inflection point in American history. This is the point where America stops being this kind of little tin horn frontier former colony and starts to become a presence on the world stage in terms of military power, economic power, and uh, and influence, and and also in terms of ambition, and uh, and it's also a time when um, 
internally, the country is reorienting. People are moving to cities. There are, people are moving off farms and, and going to cities to, uh, uh, to work. And, um, and you also have these waves of immigrants coming to America. And they, by and large, land in cities as well. And they end up finding the kind of jobs in um, you know, textile sweatshops and, and, uh, and manufacturing uh, companies that are uh, kind of ripe for investigative reporting to, um, to explore. Anyway, there's all these changes going on. But the one thing that's not changing is the status of women. Women are um, the weaker sex. Women's job is to tend to their uh, husbands and children. Uh, women are, and I'm I'm not endorsing any of these ideas, but this is what seems to be the case. Uh, women are not to be given any serious kind of responsibility, either physical or or mental. Uh, they're thought to be kind of weak-minded and weak-bodied and prone to hysteria. And so they don't participate in public life. They can't vote yet. It's going to be a long time before they can vote. Although there are, there are you know, rumblings that, that, that women want the vote. Suffrage, the suffrage movement is, is underway. Um, but they don't participate in public life. They, they can't even be on a jury. So Lizzie Borden's jury was, uh, was all men, as I recall. And so um, it's interesting to me that then that these... Uh, these young women who wanted to uh, report often turned to stories that um, informed that despair, informed that uh, oppression of women that was in place. So many of these stories are about things that would not happen to a man. They're things that happen to women. They're ways that women are exploited and taken advantage of. And I, and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that historical context and uh, I'll warn you ahead. We're going to come back to the whole Pulitzer Hearst duel. That's a, that's a separate that's a separate lane here. But just in terms of what was happening in the world, um, it seems to me that the table was sort of set for exactly this kind of reporting, and this reporting actually had um, had some impact uh, on yeah. the status of women in many cases. Yeah, I mean, it it it's a, it was a very interesting moment. I mean, so as you point out, like women had very few rights, right? They couldn't vote. If they were married, a lot of times they couldn't own property. Um, the work opportunities were, you know, very slim. I mean, in a way you can see like this whole stunt reporter movement as like a push for employment. Um, certainly that was how Nellie Bly got into it. She was really looking for a meaningful job and really um, needed some money. Um, and at the same time, sort of dismayingly, it was a really low time for the women's suffrage movement. They had sort of had a surge earlier and had a lot of very prominent defeats um, right. and really were not gaining any traction during the 1890s. You know, they would start to get their footing, you know, maybe like 1910, 11, 13, you know, 13. Um, but so there just wasn't a lot of, of, of action on that front. So one of the things that these women was do, were doing was that you know the fact that they were in female bodies gave them access to female spaces. And so they could report very specifically on um, factory conditions, on sexual harassment, on the way that if you were like a poor woman and taken to a public hospital, the way that you might be treated or mistreated. Um, one of Nell Nelson's really interesting exposés is about um, you know, a multi-level marketing scheme, which is targeted specifically at women, where you know you have to pay a lot of money up front to get patterns to crochet, I don't know, various things, various doilies, which there wasn't really any market for. And so the company was really making its money off the women buying the patterns, mm -hmm. not by there being any market for these crocheted goods. Um, so yeah, I mean, so in one way, like they were able to expose the way that, that women were particularly being abused by these industries. And in another way, I mean, in a way, like a lot of the stunts that you started to see like in 1896 seem kind of silly, particularly compared to the more substantive um, social exposés of earlier. But they also just showed women being strong and brave. And right, you know, right there, that contradicted like, 
everything that was in medical school textbooks, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. about them being weak minded, yeah. about them being, you know, frail and timid and, you know, having particularly sensitive nerves. Um, so there was a real, I think, value and inspiration just in the, their sort of being like strong bodies in space, um, which I think is really important. And I did just want to highlight one more thing when we talk about the 1890s. You know, it was also um, a particularly terrible period for African Americans. And two of the women that I look at, um, Ida B. Wells and Victoria Earl Matthews, I track their careers because they're similar demographically in that they're born during the same time period and kind of doing a lot of, making a lot of breakthroughs in investigative reporting at this time, but they weren't stunt reporters, um, but they were right. exposing a lot of those ills that were t particularly being felt by um, African-Americans. You know, Ida B. Wells has her famous anti-lynching work and um, Victoria or Matthews talks about the way that a lot of um, black women moving up from the South to these Northern cities are being entrapped by employment mm -hmm. agencies. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, Ida, Ida Wells is on my list as, as yeah. we're sort of going through them. I think her work is is uh, is really amazing and, and very, very brave. And as you say, not, not truly uh, girl stunt reporters, or, no, not at all. Just, no. uh, but just a just a really good reporter. Um, Joan Downs uh, apparently posted a question that for some yeah, reason there's a I can't ton of, It looks like there's five questions in the ask a question section. Um, so, so if you uh, let's see if I can figure it out. Oh, let me click on. It. Let me see. Oh, Did they show I've up. Got it. Uh, now that was the wrong thing to do. I don't see the question. Do you see the question from Joan? I see, so, oh yeah, so if you click on the five next to ask a question, then all the unanswered questions. Oh, come. gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, let's see. Well, okay, here's here's John's question. Uh, is there a way to use Bly's experience to humanize current stories about mental illness? For example, could we remind journalists to note the mentally ill are more often victims of violence than violent themselves? And full disclosure, I've had clinical uh, depression since childhood. I am also a published freelance writer. Great question, Joan. Thank you. Yeah, um, that is a great question. I, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that Bly did do was to be very sympathetic to the people that she was writing about and this kind of earlier wave of people who were doing undercover reporting in England. Um, a lot of times there was a lot of kind of disgust at the poverty or you know lack of culture that the, these people found among the people that they were writing about. Um, and Bly really took a lot of care, um, even with people who did seem to be mentally ill, um, to portray them in, in a sympathetic light. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things of value that she does is, you know, question who has the ability to make a diagnosis and, you know, in whose benefit it is to make a diagnosis. And, you know, the advocacy that she had for, um, you know, that it shouldn't be women going in and just being diagnosed by what she portrays as, as like very uncaring male doctors um, that you really needed, that you really needed perhaps more more sympathetic people making the diagnosis and also that that there needed to be one of the things that most dismayed her was that there was no like charting or tracking of improvement like once you were in the black Wells asylum you were there and she was like there was never any like checking in to see if you're getting better there was no way to get out just once you had that label um you were there for good so i don't know that that Bly's, you know descriptions of what was going on would be really square up with things happening in um, 2021. Uh, but she certainly was, you know, an empathetic um, reporter of what she saw. So Kim, here's a question from people who seem to know you. Okay. Hi, Kim. It's Linda Reed. Sue and I are on the call. Happy birthday. Hi. We're wondering Thank how you. you pared down the number of characters in the book. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I did, or it was more that, um, like, after I had kind of found the cohort of people that I wanted to follow, I just didn't let myself, you know, um, 
you know, follow anymore. Like, like there's one great reporter, Ada Patterson, who just could very easily have been in the book. So I was looking for people who, like one who demonstrated different things. Like one of the fascinating things to me was that so many of these women like used the opportunity of stunt reporting to then do completely different things, right? right. So, you know, Eva McDonald and Victoria O. Matthews like really became activists and other people became novelists and Elizabeth Jordan like really became an editor first at The World, then at um, Harper's Bazaar, then at Harper's Books, you know, really like encouraging and developing the careers of other people. Um, so, so I didn't want you know two people who echoed each other too closely in terms of their right. life history, right. but Billy, I mean, you made this point which we didn't really get to talk about earlier, where, in a way, there are a lot of similarities between the women who ended up in this field. I mean, one, so they're all born during like about a five-year span of like during or right after the Civil War, right. and um, so I feel like that impacted their experiences and opportunities, and then like a lot of them are orphans or don't have a father figure, um, right. so a lot of them really had to make money, and compared to other female writers at the time, um, they weren't particularly, they didn't have college educations. Like some people think that a college education wasn't available to a 19th century woman. It was in some format and most of these women just didn't have them. And then one more thing that they tended to have in common was that um, they tended to be from the West and um, I know that, that Linda and Sue who asked the question are in San Francisco and Seattle, but that, that's not what they meant by the West. Like they talked about Nellie yeah. Bias being from the West because she was like from Western Pennsylvania or a yeah, ton Pittsburgh, of them right. were from like Wisconsin. And then you have Eva McDonald from Minnesota. And I think it was just a little less proper out there in the wild West, um, like the expectations of, of what, a, a nice woman might do might be like perhaps a little bit looser so right. they didn't feel quite as constrained as you know someone maybe growing up in Boston did at right. the time. Yeah, yeah. So let me interject uh, at least one more question of my own yeah. here and we'll go back to uh, we have several questions uh, from uh, people listening in that I want to get back to but um, I, this is an important point I think. Um, these stunt reporters came along at a time when we were on the cusp of this titanic struggle in journalism between the two titans of the age, the two giants of American journalism, Joseph Pulitzer, German immigrant, older, always in bad health. Nobody knows why he lived as long as he did. And, uh, and the young, attractive uh, William Randolph Hearst. Um, and uh, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the, the two they owned multiple papers, but the two key ones in, in New York and how that provided the, um, uh, the context for, for so much of this um, uh, stunt reporting and, and how that became the place where um, stunt reporting kind of blossomed and, and arguably kind of outgrew itself at some point. But talk to us about Pulitzer and Hearst, the war between them and where these uh, girl reporters fit into that. Yeah, yeah, that that is a great question. Um, and sometimes I thought of like that that battle between the two of them as like the spine of the book, and then you know looking at these stunt reporters and seeing how they fit into it. So Pulitzer was just um, he was older than everybody else that I'm writing about, and everyone else that I'm writing about is almost exactly the same age. First and Nellie Bly are a year away from each other, um, which is I think interesting to think about. And so Pulitzer was just like a journalism visionary. Like he just came into New York and had all of these ideas about what would make an interesting paper. And you know, each year after he bought the world, like the circulation just went up and up and up. Like he just really had his finger on the pulse of like one, what would be popular and two, um, I don't know, he just had a sense of like the ethics of journalism as playing a really important role in civic life. Um, you know, and he wanted to be on the side of the poor and he wanted to be on the side of labor. Um, and, and said that very vocally in terms of, you know, what, what he wanted his paper to be in his personal life. He didn't always live that out. Um, but so like all eyes were really on him and his paper, including 
like the young William Randolph Hearst, who like went to work at um, Pulitzer's office after flunking out of Harvard and kind of like gleaned everything that he could and then um, took that knowledge to run his father's paper, The Examiner in San Francisco. And like the paper, you know, everything he did, everything like right out of Pulitzer's playbook, um, having these illustrations, having very like activist journalism where reporters would be kind of involved in the stories that they were writing. Um, lots of like contests and ways for reader interaction. Um, so he builds these skills of the examiner and then like comes back to New York in 1895, buying the New York Journal to compete with Pulitzer on his own turf. And yeah, it's just a circulation battle between them throughout the rest of the 1890s. And part of the ammunition that they used was um, these women doing these kind of investigations um, because you know it was so profitable and that's what people wanted and they really wanted to increase circulation. And um, yeah. That was so that was like one of one of the tools that they used. Though I think that makes them the women sound like they had less yeah. agency than they really had. Well, you mentioned before that the, these women established their own brands. These bylines became brands that were were powerfully associated with that particular person. For for Hearst and Pulitzer, they kind of became commodities or something that helps sell newspapers. And and you cite a number of examples where uh, these uh, squadrons of, of young women reporters would be deployed to cover stories. These were no longer stunt stories. They were, these were just big, splashy, sometimes lurid stories of the day that um, that everybody wanted to know about. And and they would send these young women to cover them and uh, and one capitalize on the bylines which helped to sell newspapers but also um i think they relied on the fact that these women despite the fact they were covering just a conventional news story used many of the same techniques and gimmicks that they used when they were undercover and you know they and they would and we'll, we can come back to this maybe if we get to talk about new journalism but they were very alert to circumstances to what people look like to where they lived mm -hmm. what they mm -hmm. ate um you know to how to how the quotidian little mundane things of daily life um you know uh how how they how they got by and so um it's it's really interesting to me that on the one hand Hearst and Pulitzer were uh, kind of cashing in on these now famous women mm -hmm. and uh, and these women were just kind of a uh, Kind of quietly doing their own thing, and and I, I really um, I really like that. I want to get to um, a few more questions here that we have from people. Um, uh, Louisa and another person, Laura, both want to know if you have a favorite reporter. Was there one that um, really captivated? I I think I can yeah. make a guess. Do I get to guess? It's, yeah, I guess. Go for it. I'm guessing you don't know who it is because I think it's the I think it's the girl reporter. Oh, I wasn't even going to say her, but yeah, can I have if I can have three? <laughs> it would be sure. it would be the the girl reporter. Um, again, I just spent so much time like examining her prose, and she was just very interesting to me. She just like really had a unique voice and really seemed like she had all these like literary flourishes um, and she just really seemed like a young writer trying to figure out her her way and her path um yeah we I should just, tell people listening that engaging. the girl reporter that was the byline for the young woman who went undercover in chicago to um try to get an abortion and reported yep. on all that and her identity has sort of never been discovered and uh the fact that kim couldn't discover it tells me nobody ever will because she tried really really hard to figure I out do have to say, I, I i i get close i mean i feel like i'm approaching it in the book i feel like i have some good options in the book yep you got be. you got close right um so yes the girl reporter i do think Bly, but i don't need to talk more about her but i just feel like um she, she was an exceptionally, I don't know, ambitious, brave, interesting person who faced a lot of hardship in her life um, and just 
like kept plugging forward um, and was willing to keep recreating herself. And then I think the other one who faced um, an also a lot of hardship in her life is Victoria Earl Matthews. And she was somebody who I didn't go into the project knowing about. Um, but she also started, like Kate Swan McGurk, like started doing this very straight laced reporting, reporting a lot of women's page reporting about how to beautify your house. Um, and then she was a big supporter of Ida B. Wells. She organized a benefit which helped Wells publish her first book, um, Southern Horrors, which was documentation of lynching. And then, um, then in the mid 1890s, her son dies. And that is really like her, and he was only 15. And that's really like this, this break in her career. She goes to the South and she starts seeing the abuses of these Southern employment agencies, which are luring black young women to the North um, and taking advantage of them. Um, yeah, and she really like turns her life over to both exposing those abuses and then supporting these women and creating a settlement house um, that helps them get jobs and offers them a place to stay and a place to look after their kids. And um, yeah, it's just, just a really, really fascinating, um, highly principled person. Well, I'm glad we have a little bit of time left because this is um, something I really wanted to ask about. I think you make a really interesting argument in the book that uh, that these stunt reporters are an important antecedent to uh, what we call new journalism, which was the journalism that that uh, that I kind of grew up with in journalism school back in the 1970s. And that uh, you know really um, inspired a lot of people from my uh, age cohort to to go into journalism. There were there were sort of two 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 big drawing cards at the time. One one was um, investigative reporting because I was in school right after Woodward and Bernstein had brought down a president, and so lots of people wanted to be investigative reporters. But a lot of people also were really taken with um, the work that was being done by by Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion. Norman Mailer, Truman Capote, uh, who you talk about in the book. Um, uh, this new journalism, as it was dubbed, was um, uh, fact-based nonfiction that employed uh, some of the techniques of fiction in the interest of having a very compelling narrative. That was, that was sort of the shorthand for it, although in his essay about new journalism, which you cite in the book, Tom Wolfe also talked again about these telling mundane details that kind of um, illuminate the lives, particularly of people in cities that Wolf thought just nobody just got, nobody figured out what was going on in the country because they really didn't understand who these, um, what the hippies were about or uh, any of these other subcultures that he liked to, to, uh, to write about. And, um, and so I think you make a really, really good case that, um, uh, that there's a continuum as there often is. There's, it's not always, things don't always just spring out of nothing. But talk a little bit about what you see as the relationship between the stunt reporters and um, what we called new journalism back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Yeah, um, I mean, I learned the same way that you did, is that this nonfiction writing that I loved was really kind of launched by this cohort of writers in the 60s and the 70s, you know, and that Tom Wolfe had given it a name, New Journalism, and the tenets of New Journalism, as he saw them, were scene-based construction, lots of dialogue, um, a distinct point of view of the narrator, um, and this kind of status detail, which you talk about is um, right, right. You know, the, the things of daily life that people show use to show other people who they are and what their role is in the world. Um, and it just and also the narrator's me. often in the story. The, you know, yeah, the yeah, author yeah. is often yeah. a, you know, it's, these are first person books a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. That gets to that distinct point of view, right? Like sometimes it's like a, a omniscient point of view that's just a voice but very often it's it's the voice of the author who is also an I um, and it just struck me as I was reading Bly that you know she's doing all these things and the star reporter who's falling in her wake are doing all those things and actually like new journalism wasn't even a term unique to Tom Wolfe it was coined by Matthew Arnold to describe um, this kind of journalism, like he's talking about what's going on in England but at the time, but it's very much a reflection of what's going on in the US and some of the things that, you know, Pulitzer is playing with. Um, 
kind of these innovations that's making journalism much more story-based and frankly, more interesting. I think we might be we're coming up. Time. We're coming up on the hour. <laughs> And I wish we had another hour, Kim. I know. Um, I, so I want to urge to everyone to check out Sensational. Um, it's an apt title because the book is sensational. I love it. Uh, Kim, I'm, I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. It's a really, really great book. And um, I hope that uh, our writing group reconvenes soon and we'll have a chance to uh, see each other in person. So thank you, everyone who joined us tonight. And um, congratulations, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Bill, for taking the time. Much appreciated. And thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>